Twitter is a tiny echo chamber. I'm not sure the left understand the monumental ass whipping being dished out to them on YouTube. Now, I've never started a show before with a quote from Paul Joseph Watson, but when the basement dwelling, the tropic selling online racist tweeted this in 2017, many on the left thought he had a point. That's because with figures like Alex Jones, Ben Shapiro and PewDiePie, the right had build up, built up a network on YouTube unparalleled by their left wing competitors. However, more recently, the left on YouTube have mounted something of a comeback. Accounts like ContraPoints, H Bomber Guy, and Philosophy Tube are regularly reaching hundreds of thousands of viewers challenging the talking points of the alt right with creative, accessible, and often very funny videos. So tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by the creator of one of these channels, Ollie Fawn. Ollie Fawn is the founder of Philosophy Tube, which has amassed 400,000 subscribers, putting out videos which, for example, explain the, the philosophy, not the politics, the philosophy of Antifa, defend trans rights, or take on the ideas of Jordan Peterson. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you on. Uh, how, how's your day been? How are you doing? It's been pretty good, yeah. Um, I've been hard at work writing my next video and going to the gym and getting everything prepared, ordering all kinds of horrific things online to be props for the next one, which I'm very excited about. Scalpels and fake blood and all sorts. Okay, that, that, that intro about props is going to be a good segue into this little clip. So I'm hoping that there's a fair bit of crossover between our audience and Ollie's. But in case there's not, uh, we're going to show a clip of Philosophy Tube so you can get an idea of what Ollie is about. So this is a clip from a recent video about Jordan Peterson. Was to say, look, a work of art can be stylish, yes? And to say that it's stylish implies some standard. But stylishness is less about the work conforming to an external objective standard and more about a particular harmony between all the notes. No, they can't hear us now. So sing the song of your life like a work of art, with balance and grace. Coloratura espressivo, some forte and some pianissimo, some solos and some ensemble pieces, a little bit of dolente, and probably some wrong notes, especially if it's me singing. The clashes acknowledged and faced up to, but presented in such a way as to make them sublime, so that the effect of the whole is a kind of harmony. And this too is consistent with hedonism. In order to get what you desire, you have to know yourself and understand all of your varied wants, even the dark ones. See, this is why Jordan Peterson's favorite Russian author is Dostoevsky, but mine... Oh, we're back. Uh, we're gonna go into more detail later in the show about your, your analysis and critique of Jordan Peterson, but just for now, I wanna know why are you topless with a snake around your neck? Um, basically, I thought it would be fun. <laughs> Uh, as I was researching the the Jordan Peterson video, which again we'll, we'll get into the the creative process behind it, but um, I found it, I started off researching like moral relativism and uh, why some people on the right, not just sort of the Peterson and the right wing sort of dude bros, but also people like uh, Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin have a have a real uh, bee in their bonnet about moral relativism. Um, and I found a, I found a video from Stefan Molyneux where he said that relativism was part of a demonic plot, and I was like, it's kind of an interesting image. And then I was reading Peterson's book, and he um, he talked about uh, like if people ever knew what I was really doing, there would be hell to pay. And then he talks about like this like the serpent of chaos, and I was like, it would be fun. Like, who's the embodiment of chaos? Let, do like let's do it in character as the devil. So I do the whole video in character as as Satan. Um, and I, I I went through a lot of uh, a lot of different looks and like that the like doing the makeup and planning out what it was going to look like was a lengthy lengthy process and that's eventually what I settled on um, and I I had had a live horse in a previous video and uh, I just thought can I get snakes can I do that and then I just googled like snakes near me and it was really expensive and then uh, a small small uh, YouTube channel called uh, Black Coffee Collective got in touch and they were like we've got some snakes if you want to borrow them in exchange for a shout out so I was like okay cool and that's how that happened and they lent me uh, a six foot four python named Tigger who is lovely who you saw in that clip and uh, a little Mexican black king snake called Elvira, who you can see in some of the close-ups. Uh, so that's that's how that happened. <laughs> I was surprised by how comfortable you looked with the snakes. I thought maybe you were a kind of snake keeper or something. No, no, I just love animals. I mean, I, I grew up watching Steve Irwin, um, and I, I loved animals all my life. Like, I, I sometimes think if I wasn't uh, doing this and being an actor, I'd have like wanted to do zoology or marine biology or something. Um, I never had any pets, but I, I just love animals of all kinds, so it was just a delight to have them on the show. <laughs> uh, sorry we haven't got any for you here tonight. Mm. Uh, I'm well, going to say, actually, it's, a, it's a, I feel very naked to be streaming, to be live streaming without coloured lights 
and and without candles and stuff, which is how uh, Gary knows that I usually do all my live streams that way. With the red lights. Yeah, yeah. With like, I've got like two coloured lights in my rooms and like bookshelf lights and like little candles and so on. I always I always start my live stream by lighting a candle. So apologies to all my usual live stream viewers who haven't seen me do that. <laughs> Um, all right, we're going to get on to moral relativism, Jordan Peterson, all, all, all in a moment. Uh, first of all, let's just take a step back. I want to know who you are. Tell us your story. How did you come to be someone making YouTube videos with half a million views, critiquing Jordan Peterson? Get, take uh, me through the process. Um, well, my name, for those who don't know me, my name's Ollie Thorne. Uh, I'm 26. Uh, I'm from Newcastle in the north of England. Um, I'm a professional actor and uh, a YouTuber. I... I was doing a degree in philosophy six years ago, like a, a four-year master's in Scotland, um, and uh, that was I was in the last year to pay the old tuition fees. So when mm. the coalition government tripled the fees, I was like, that's really unfair. Um, so you were 3000 and it was going up to 9000 Yeah. Um, I thought that was really unfair, and a girlfriend at the time said, you should do a YouTube channel for your stand-up comedy. And I was like, I don't, I don't really have enough material for that, and I'm not very good. Um, but I like the idea of doing a YouTube channel. And th so those two things stuck in my brain. And then I applied for um, I applied for a summer internship at Private Eye, and mm. I got rejected by Ian Hislop. I, I got like a rejection email from like Ian. Um, maybe that's a coincidence. Maybe Ian Hislop doesn't really know who I am. But uh, I suddenly I had three months free at the summertime, and I was like, maybe I should start that YouTube project. So um, my original plan was just to record my university lectures and put them on the internet. So like philosophy education but for free like as like hey screw you coalition government i'm gonna make it freely available and my university were like you can't do that so i said well i'm just gonna to have to film myself summarizing what i've learned so i started making videos in my bedroom being like this is what i learned at philosophy a level this is what i learned today you learned it for free i had to pay for it like an asshole but now you've got it for free and uh it had 100 subs at the end of day one about a year in it had 10,000 when i left uni which was kind of pretty modest as far as youtube channels go um, and then now it's like knocking on the door of 400,000 and it's like my full-time job and pays the bills, which is amazing. And the, it, it, there's been like a few, a few kind of changes and sea changes as it's gone along the last six years. But, um, it started out as a position of like, I want to, I want to give away free philosophy education. So, so do you feel like you're a philosopher or an educator first and a sort of political activist second? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I or an actor I, potentially first, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I say actor first, definitely. Um, I think that what I do on the on the show is like, has always been and is increasingly uh, acting. Sometimes I put in like uh, little bits of like explicit drama, like the Steve Bannon video, which we'll get onto, has like a dramatic monologue in it that I wrote. Um, but yeah, I, I, when people say, what do you do? I say I'm an actor and a YouTuber. Um, and I see what I do as like, I mean, we were talking a little bit about this before, before we started uh, broadcasting. Like, I see what I do is... I don't call myself a philosopher. Other people do. I see what I do as, like, opening doors. Like, have you ever thought about this? Like, have you thought about this in a different way? What more might you think about or wonder or get curious about if, like, if you realise there are, like, lots of doors in your mind and that you've never even seen before? And if somebody just on the other side, you're like, oh, I've never seen this room before. This is great. Um, and you might you might find a room in your head that you you prefer to live in. Um, so that's what I try and do is is go around people's heads knocking, <laughs> knocking on people's heads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Knock people on the head, reminding yeah. them that there are some doors they could open. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to another clip, and we're going to talk about Steve Bannon. So can we get up the first minute uh, of the video about Steve Bannon? Good evening. My name's Ollie Thorne. Tonight's show features an heroic firefighter, a villainous pyromaniac, a 10,000-year-old skull, and a fantastic musical number in the finale. But before the show begins, I'd like to say that at no point during tonight's performance am I going to call Steve Bannon a racist, a sexist, a transphobe, an anti-Semite, or anything of the sort, not because I don't think those words have weight to them, but because I'm trying to reach the same audience as him, and I want to try a different tactic. So what I am going to do is explain exactly where Steve Bannon is wrong, and exactly where he's correct, which is in more places than I expected him to be. So there's a couple of things to note about this video that I want to talk about. So one, in, in that clip you just saw, you start by saying you won't be labeling Bannon a racist or a sexist or mm -hmm. an anti-Semite. You'll be taking his arguments on their own terms, I suppose, as it were. Um, and it wasn't in that clip, but you spend most of the video dressed as a fireman. As a sexy fireman, yeah. So, so can you explain both of those Decisions. Um, so the decision to start it off that way came from a few places. Uh, one is that I just writing the first few seconds of a video is always the hardest for me. I don't know how to do it. Um, some people I think like uh, like 
H bomb and Nat contrapoints are like really good. Like Nat writes the first thirty seconds of Nat, so it's like so good. Whereas mine, I never know what to do. Um, so I just start come out and say really awkwardly, like, this is what I'm going to do. So that's partly for the reason. That's partly it. Uh, it's because I don't know how to write intros to videos still after six years. Um, rarely do, anyway. Uh, part of it was, I thought, something that I try and do deliberately a lot with the show is make the video that people don't expect. And I figured, like, there's a lot of videos on Steve Bannon that are just like, he's a racist, he's a sexist, he's a transfer. And I was like, cool, yeah, definitely think those are valuable perspectives worth talking about. And I was like, but what's the thing people don't expect? And something I found when I was researching him and that I that I get into a little bit in the video um, is that sometimes he gets the first bit right. And I was like, why? okay, why does he sometimes start from an interesting place and then like veer off? Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I thought that if people who are fans of Steve Bannon saw me say that at the start, they might be more inclined to stick around. Um, for the record, I don't think that I did actually manage to be anything like impartial or unbiased about Steve Bannon. Like, I, I, and, I, and it's the same with the Brexit video. I tried to be, um, but I obviously failed. Um, and I think I, especially with the Brexit video, failed in, in, inter in interesting ways. But um, there were people who were fans of Steve Bannon who stuck around and watched it, and they, and they told me, they were like, I appreciate you like trying, and I see that. Um, so it was partially out of a desire to get them to stick around uh, partially out of not knowing how to write the introduction to a video, um, and yeah, and, and like partly just um, wanting to to start things in a different way, because I knew that my usual audience, many of whom are lefties, would be like, "What do you mean the things he gets right? What?" And I like I like to do that because I like making the video that they don't expect either. Because um, we were talking a bit before the show, I get a lot of comments from people who are just like, choke me, daddy, and like whatever I make, they'd be like, yeah, I love it, it's great, and I'm like, but, okay, but I want to like give you the thing you don't expect either um, and that's that's fun for me that's just how I get my my sick kicks um, as for why was I dressed as a sexy fireman uh, so if you roll on that video a little bit further you'll find you get to the opening credit sequence um, and you'll find that the play was inspired by uh, the, the video was inspired by a Max Frisch play called The Arsonists um, which which I love it's a fantastic play that I saw at the Hen and Chickens theatre last year um, and uh, it's about uh, the, a town where there's a bunch of arson attacks and the whole thing's a metaphor for fascism. And uh, I thought, okay, there's something in here about like fire as a metaphor for fascism that I quite like. Um, I knew that I wanted to have a character in the video who was an arsonist, who like didn't immediately appear to be one, like a very charming arsonist who you only figure out later is actually the one doing all these burning, all these burnings. Uh, so uh, there's a dramatic monologue in the video that I wrote that's kind of split up where this arsonist talks to the camera and uses all the tricks that Steve Bannon uses, so you can kind of see them in operation. And then I thought, okay, what's the natural foil for an arsonist? Like, what's the presenter persona going to be? Well, it should be a fireman. Um, and then I, I was, I remember very, very clearly. Uh, I was toying with that idea, and then I realised that um, Antifa and Antifire sound quite similar if you say Antifire quite quickly. So I thought I just wanted to open the video proper with me being like, I'm a fireman, I hate fire, I fight fire all the time. You might say I'm Antifa. Hey. <laughs> just, and that was where it came from. I was like, okay, I have to have that. I have to have that joke in there. Uh, I'm just going to do it because it's fun. Um, but yeah, I like to make the video that people don't expect. I like to make the video that no one else can make as well. Um, I figured like there's a lot of videos on Steve Bannon, but I was like, what is the philosophy tube video on Steve Bannon? And that's that's kind of what I try to do a lot of the time. So sometimes I'll like I'll so when I did my video on Brexit, I was like, okay, there's like a million videos on Brexit. Like you guys have probably made like half of them. I was like, okay, but what's the philosophy tube video on it? What's the thing that no one else can do that I can do? Because and this kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier on about like how I started out. When I started out making YouTube videos, there was nobody summarizing philosophy. There was like Three Minute Philosophy, the animated series, who was just still up and they're still really good. Um, and there was like a few recordings of lectures, but there was like no one else doing it. Um, so I, there was this gap that I like jumped into and, and did well. But now you, you can like throw a stone in the woods and you'll hit like 20 vloggers or YouTubers summarizing Plato. Like everyone's fucking read The Republic now and it's summarizing it everywhere. Um, so I was like, okay, I need to figure out what's the thing that, that no one else can make. And it's, it's Steve Bannon and a sexy fireman and a Tory arsonist and like all kind of weird stuff uh, that kind of keeps you hooked and it keeps me entertained when I'm making it and hopefully keeps the audience entertained as well. It definitely seems to. I mean, you've said, I mean, I don't know if you want to be unbiased, but you've said you didn't quite manage in that video to be unbiased. But I mean, No, what, I didn't, not at all. What, what, what is particular about your videos, I think, to other videos that sort of like I've watched made by left-wingers, and I suppose this is because your philosophy tube and it's, it's about philosophy, is that it starts from first principles. 
So it doesn't require much prior knowledge from the audience. And you're taking the audience through the argument step by step without, uh, I suppose, strategies like guilt by association, which might more often be used in sort of like popular political discourse, especially on Twitter, for example. Well, I'm so glad was, you say that. I try to. No, I no, I definitely think that. you do. Yeah. Um, and if you want to see the full critique of Steve Bannon, uh, do watch the video. But yeah, I recommend. It. Uh, one before my, they one do that, things. I want to preview. What does he get right, and what does he get wrong? Um, mm, I'm cautious because I don't. I don't want to say here like without nuance, like because I don't want people. You to don't want to like, butcher the argument. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have people been like, "Prosper Tube says Steve Bannon is right about X, Y, Z." Um, so I, I say, uh, for instance, that um, Steve Bannon has some critiques of what you and I would probably call neoliberalism, or he doesn't use that language. And I'm like, okay, like these start from an interesting place. Um, but then kind of veer off and he's kind of using like techniques to to get you to kind of think about it in, in a bit of a slant that benefits him um, and then I end up burying my head in the woods and there's a joke about skulls uh, and it all goes very weird yeah I mean I think potentially to summarize it it's a risky thing to do but I mean to me it seemed like you were saying what he got right was a critique of uh, I suppose the financial crisis in the sense that people were screwed over elites screwed over the masses but he misidentified that as caused by the lapsed morality of baby boomers because he, he was says unwilling his, to sort of yeah. point the finger at capitalism because of his that's what I he suppose, says in his film um i think you know i think steve bannon i don't want to comment on what he personally believes i don't really care what he personally believes but it seems like sometimes he's on the verge of saying socialism or barbarism but he just doesn't he, he doesn't point out the socialism bit, right? He, he won't go to socialism. Uh, and like what I say at the end of the video is like, you know, he kind of realises that w there's something needs to change about the world and he won't tell you explicitly what he wants to happen, but he'll kind of lead you to it. Um, so that's what I was sort of cautious about. And that's why I created this character, the arsonist, who like doesn't explicitly say anything. He's all he's all hints. He's all like, oh, these firefighters, they're all covering their faces and kicking down doors. That's not right. Like who's behind all these arson attacks? And meanwhile, he's like preparing a Molotov cocktail and like leaning on a barrel of petrol. Um, and then the ending of that video I'm particularly proud of, but you'll just have to watch it to find out. <laughs> all right, let's do Jordan Peterson now. Uh, obviously, we've, we've talked about Jordan Peterson before on the show. He is, uh, I mean, an archetype of, of a, a particular, <laughs> Very a particular clever. type of... Very clever. <laughs> is it? I don't think I've realised how clever that might have been. What's... Well, because he's always banging on about Jungian archetypes. Ah, oh, shit! You've, you you know Jordan Peterson better than I do. Anyway, let's let's go to a to a clip of it, uh, and then we'll discuss what you make of Jordan Peterson. Someone spent an entire Sunday in a bathtub, coming down from getting absurdly high on MDMA, and it was one of the bleakest periods of my life because my brain wouldn't make any more of the happy juice. And now I don't do MDMA anymore because it's a whole lot of pleasure in one go, but it limits the pleasure of my whole. life. Uh, I think there you saw three seconds of Ollie in the bath, and then uh, a blank screen. <laughs> uh, so if you want to see, if you want to see, uh, that's not what the video. Any more like. of the video, you'll have to go to Philosophy Tubes YouTube. It had a lot more uh, that's content than we, we we showed then. Uh, Jordan Peterson, what do you make of him? Why did you think it was relevant to make a video about Jordan Peterson? Why do you think he's so relevant at the moment? Why have so many people sort of seen him as? Uh, I mean, I think some people do see him as a voice of a generation. But anyway, your take on Jordan Peterson? Um, I think other people have made better videos than me about what his appeal is and why he appeals to the people he does. Um, for me, I was trying to, and again, I think I, I failed, um, to take his arguments on their own terms because I, I knew that there were people who really philosophically buy into what he says. Um, and I, I thought I'd found... I thought I'd found a lot of big problems with it. I think I actually just found one big problem with it. And basically what I, what we're brushing up against here is that I don't like that video. <laughs> this is what we were talking about beforehand. Um, it's very popular, it did very well, but I don't particularly like it. Um, so I think that there is uh, like a, a big central contradiction in Peterson's philosophy that he doesn't really address vis-a-vis uh, -vis order and chaos, which are kind of central concepts to his whole shtick, uh, are very relative uh, in a way that he doesn't really seem to address. Um, and that poses, I think, big problems for how he wants to then use his system. Um, but uh, other than that, um, I think other people have said what needs to be said about him better than me. Um, certainly better than that video. Yeah, I mean, I suppose uh, I thought it was interesting. I mean, I suppose what was novel, what was different about it to other videos I've seen about Jordan Peterson is, well, uh, the way it did seem to come from an angle that was very philosophical as opposed to political. Mm -hmm. So if you look at sort of Jordan Peterson's major argument, 
uh, it is sort of like an attack on relativism, which he sees as associated with nihilism. Mm -hmm. And that breaks down uh, all meaning and all hierarchy and order in the world. Remove because the possibility of, of categorization. Yeah, yeah, because of the combination of postmodernism and Marxism, which don't particularly make sense in, in, in combination with each other. But I think your argument was that even on its own terms, his argument relies on a form of relativism, right? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of... That was the bit I liked about that video, is I think I did hit up on that. He, he does use a little bit of relativism, even though he's kind of pretending not to. Um, and he's sort of relativist when it suits him and not when it doesn't. And, and you know, I think I, I mean, that's, that's fine. Like, a lot of people are. Certainly, I, I'm biased. Absolutely, when I make videos, I'm biased. But, but you haven't made a career arguing against relativism. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Peterson... I see a lot of Peterson fans who are like, "Oh, he's not political," and it's like he, he really is. He really, like his his biases, like anybody, like like anybody, uh, are are politically motivated. And and you know, again, I think that's fine. But I didn't, you know, he's made a career telling people that these things are bad. Um, and again, it's about like knocking on the door and saying, "Hey, like maybe there's other rooms here. Like you're having a great time in Jordan Peterson Castle, but like maybe there's a basement to that that you might want to consider looking into." Um, but again, I'm not especially fond of that video. Mm. <laughs> um, I mean, in any case, it was successful. So you've made you've made videos about Steve Bannon and Jordan Peterson both critiquing their work that have both had a large reach. Would you, this is now a controversial question on the left, would you debate them? Well, first of all, I want to say there's different categories for success. A lot of people saw those videos. I would consider the Steve Bannon one to be a success, whereas I wouldn't consider the Jordan Peterson one to be a success. Okay. Um, but anyway, we can get into that later if you want. Would I debate them? Um, I, th I thought about this. Um, I don't think Peterson would want me to debate him for, for his own, like, by his own rules. So I read 12 Rules for Life, like, very, very closely, um, and he, he has a rule about, uh, what is it, uh, always tell the truth or don't lie, and or at least don't lie. And I think um, it would be dishonest of me to, to debate Peterson. Um, I don't think I could honestly, truthfully shake his hand and respectfully have a discussion with him after the things he said about trans people. Um, I think that in his approach towards trans rights, he's he's failed to live by his own rules um, and I th it would be dishonest of me to to do that so I, th I think I could make a Peterson-esque case to Peterson by saying I, I'm sorry like and, until you've addressed this I don't think I can do that um, it, it would be kind of spiritually dishonest he might enjoy hearing me say uh, to to sit in a room and pretend that that hadn't happened and it was all okay um, as for Bannon uh, Bannon's good. He's good live. He's good on stage. Like I saw him debate from, and he's he's a clever boy. Um, depends on whether or not he'd seen my video first, because I'm probably I I think I'm probably like well versed in some of Bannon's tricks that he used to pull. But if he's seen my video, then of course he knows how to pull them better, because <laughs> I because I think I got his number in that video, um, and I think I kind of uh, effectively diagnosed what he was doing. But if he's mutated his tactics since then, then maybe I'd end up doing more bad than good. Um, so I don't know about that one, but um. As for Peterson, yeah, I mean, I, I just cannot, I wouldn't want to, it would be dishonest of me to pretend that his stance on, on trans rights wasn't deeply harmful and by his own standards, by, by the standards he sets forth in his own book, like inconsistent with how he says people should live. And um, I think he needs to, as a matter of extreme urgency, revise that. And you don't think that that, because I mean, obviously his argument about well, his, his opposition to trans rights, I suppose, is, is what it basically boils down to, has quite a lot of reach. And you don't think that that would be something that would be usefully, uh, I suppose, quote unquote, rationally debated with in sort of like a public space? Uh, perhaps not as usefully as me publicly refusing to debate him on his own, like like using his own logic. Mm -hmm. Being like, look, if I were to publicly... Explain how it's on, on his own logic. Yeah, because you said at one point his position on trans rights breaks his own rules. What's what's going on there? Well, I think definitely breaks the spirit of them. Because, um, again, he has this thing of, like, tell the truth or at least don't lie. And assume that... Uh, one of the rules is assume that other people uh, might have something to offer you. And I see him being very charitable to some points of view and being not at all charitable to, to trans people. Like, in his, his book, 12 Rules for Life, he dismisses offhand, not explicitly, he doesn't spend a long time on it, he dismisses kind of the idea of trans people... But he doesn't cite a single one. Mm. He doesn't. He has not read Julius Serrano, or if he has, he hasn't demonstrated it. And I, I just think that, like, I think if he sat down and honestly looked at that book and asked himself, "Is that the best I could have done? Is that the best possible argument I could have made?" I think he would, by his own lights, find it to be lacking. Um, and I think that you know he has this bit about at the end of the book where he talks about people uh, persisting in ignorance and like thinking that they're doing good, 
and when they're really not. And like so many times in the margins of his book, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, that's what you're doing, man. Like, come on, you can do better. Um, or at least you know you say you can, or you, you seem to think you can, and have the roadmap to doing it. Um, so yeah, I, I think he can do better on that, and it would be, it would be just dishonest of me to to like again, as I say, like shake his hand and pretend it was okay. Let's. I want to return to that quote I started with. Uh, from basement dwelling in the tropics, selling online racist Paul Joseph Watson. Does he dwell in a basement? Uh, Do we know that? Well, I don't know whether. Well, he, he only he never leaves that room with the map. <laughs> so I don't know. It might be first floor. It might be an attic. We're not sure. If you live above Paul Joseph Watson, right in. <laughs> 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 um, so what was it? Twitter is a tiny echo chamber. I'm not sure the left understand the monumental ass whipping being dished out to them on YouTube. Do you think the left are still getting their asses whipped on YouTube? I mean. It's, <laughs> I suppose what this feeds into is there's, you know, there's a, a big narrative which I think has quite a lot of truth into it that YouTube is a space that the right have very effectively used to win a new generation of, of, of people to their ideas and to radicalise people essentially. And that even though the left has some presence on YouTube, it isn't quite as integrated and dominant as, as sort of the right wing culture warriors uh, that sort of fill that platform. Maybe, maybe. Um, I wonder whether that's maybe an idea and a story that they benefit from people thinking. Certainly, I mean, you can point to right-wing uh, videos or like right-wing adjacent videos that get lots and lots of views. But I mean, you can also point to cat videos that get lots and lots of views. It's hard to measure the impact that something has just by the views. Um, you know, you could say like Maru has affected an entire generation of like cats getting in boxes. Certainly, um, I think that those of us who make sort of educational content or anything politically adjacent, we're fools to think that people aren't going to raise their hands in classes and bring that stuff into universities. Mm. Um, and I've I've heard from teachers and university lecturers who were like, I have students talking to me about like Carl Benjamin. Or what what is this? I don't know it. Um, so I think we're we're fools to think that doesn't go on. Um, the the idea that like uh, this this whole kind of culture war thing is something that I'm. It's just something that kind of makes me raise my eyebrows. I think it's 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 a story that uh, it's a story that often like fits well with journalists. And when I talk to journalists and do shows and stuff, they're always very interested. In, like, so tell us about like the left tube movement. Mm. I don't know. Um, it's just I just sort of make weird videos and hope that people like them, and so do my friends, and I like my friends. Um, so yeah, it's, so you don't of, see it as a sort of strategic intervention to try and counteract the dominance of sort of like right wing culture warriors. I mean, YouTube. I understand why people. Th- why people think that and uh, you know I suppose because lots of your videos seem to fit directly into that you know the way that it's sort of like about Antifa or the way that it's about trans rights which are precisely those issues which Mm. the Ben Shapiro's of the world will be uh, propagating from their particular point of view I guess um, I suppose what we're kind of drilling down into is the fact that I see my work very differently from 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 other people and Mm. from all of you Um, I have like a very different relationship with it um I, I see what I do is more like going around knocking on the door, um, and sometimes those are, are doors that other people have been trying to bar shut. Um, and yeah, I think there's definitely value in like countering right wing ideas because there's a lot of bad philosophy out there. Um, there's a lot of like miseducation, and I see what I do is like, and again, a lot of those doors have been locked off, and I'm like, well, you know, actually, what do you think? Um, I I I think if I viewed it in terms of like I'm a soldier in a culture war. My world is war and memes. I'd just go mad. Um, so I just try and create things that I enjoy and that I have fun with and that I like for my own reasons and, and enjoy what my my friends make. And all, all of the people that people like talk about as being like left tube, we all have multiple strings to our bow. Um, and I'd like doing other things and moving into other things as well. So I have a different relationship with my work, I think, than other people do. And it's always mm. interesting to hear how other people see it and how other people see it as being like this big culturally significant thing. But again, I I have my criteria for when I think a video has succeeded and failed and, and I kind of keep... I, well, I can talk about them if you want, but I mean, they're very different than what other people mm. seem to think. I mean, yeah, talk, talk briefly about... Well, it doesn't have to be briefly. Talk at length if you want um, uh, about w- what you think it is that makes one of your videos successful or, or not. Um, I have sort of three main criteria. Um, so I told you before we started recording, I try and have this mantra in my life, curiosity, not ambition. Um, so have I created a video from curiosity or ambition? Uh, if it's curiosity, then I'm happy with it. Um, have I created it from a place of compassion or am I like being mean and grandstanding, which I guess is kind of, uh, related. Um, and like, have I, have I created it from the best part of myself? Have I done 
the best I can do, have I been honest about it. Um, it's my new book, Three Rules for Life. Yeah, that's exactly own. what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not a real thing. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's when I'm happy with it. And, and none of those have anything to do with the comments or the feedback or the emails and stuff. So my latest video on sex work, I was like, curiosity and ambition, yes. Best part of me, definitely. Have I been honest? Yeah, cool. Compassion, yeah. Um, so I'm really happy with it and I think that's my best work. Jordan Peterson won 100% ambition, no curiosity. I mean, I said uh, before we started recording, um, that I came up with, the, I knew I wanted to do a video on moral relativism, and I knew I wanted to do a video on Jordan Peterson, slowly they came together. The reason I started out wanting to do a video on moral relativism is because I saw a sculpture of Lucifer in uh, an art museum in America, and it was all like muscles and nails and wings, and, like, oh, and it was so good, and I was like, oh, I want to do that, I want to look like that. Um, and what I should have just done is done that in my own room, and just, just walked around like that for the fun of it, um, rather than make a whole video that kind of gave me an excuse to do that. And I think the video aesthetically and intellectually uh, suffered because of that, because it came from that place of ambition rather than, I wonder what I think about this if I sit down and think about it. Like, I wonder what doors I can open for myself. I'm like, no, 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 no. The Jordan Peterson video for me is like, I'm the big YouTube star, look what I can do. I've got snakes and nails and wings and yeah. And I'm gonna get loads of people being like, choke me daddy in the comments and it'll be great. And then I was like, this is bad. And I told you um, earlier on when it was rendering, I sat down and I said to myself, this is the kind of trash that only someone with no creative soul could make. And that's harsh. <laughs> I was harsh on myself. Um, but that video was made from ambition. Uh, I still, you know, it still has its plus points. The song is good. I'm pleased with the song. Um, but yeah, that, that's, I have, like, as I say, I have a different relationship with my work than other people do. And I think if I didn't, I'd, I'd go mad. Mm. If, I, if I based it on the views, then, you know, sometimes it's like got 50,000 views fewer than the previous one. I go, oh God, what have I done wrong? Or, you know, sometimes I'll I, I'll have like fewer people saying, you look hot, and then, I, and then I'll be like, oh God, I need to go and work out, and I'd, I'd lose my mind. Or, you know, I'd have a thousand people telling me, this is great, it's the best thing ever, and like three people being like, I hate you, you're cancelled, this is the worst thing, you've ruined my life. Um, I, I get letters every day from people being like, you've saved my life with mm. the Cosmonaut video. And I'm like, I can't. I can't internalize that. Like you did that yourself, you know. I just made a video, um, and I've had some like truly dark videos the other way, some truly dark messages the other way. Um, so I try and I deliberately try and maintain a different relationship to my work than other people, and one that like doesn't fit into the kind of the mm. narrative of like bread tube and left wing stuff. And because if I didn't, I think after six years creating stuff publicly, like if I don't if I don't have a criteria for when I'm happy with it, if I'm dependent on other people, I'm just gonna go mad. <laughs> I know, there's, I know there's going to be loads and loads of audience questions from you today, so I'm going to go for those in a moment. But first of all, as ever, uh, you're watching Navarro Media, you're watching Tisky Sour. As you know, this show, this channel is only, popu only possible, uh, popular I hope, but only possible because of your kind donations. So if you're already a subscriber, thank you very much. You're what makes this possible. If not, uh, you know our ask is for the equivalent of one hour's wage a month so please go to support.navaramedia.com so we can continue working around the clock uh, please like this video it means it appears in more people's news feeds uh, share it on twitter share it on facebook subscribe to the channel especially in case we have emergency shows as we did last night uh, after the european elections um and yeah i'll go to your questions in a moment i haven't been checking your comments so i can't say how brilliant they've been but i imagine they've been good uh while if i'm checking my obvious, laptop can you tell me can you tell us uh so I was thinking before you came on the show that the sort of the world you inhabit in on YouTube and the world we inhabit on YouTube that I, th I think there's a lot of crossover, but there's also sort of some differences. So we very much at Navarra Media sort of intervene in, I mean, in a way, sort of like capital P politics, you know, party mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. or the day to day, the kind of thing that you'd see on BBC News or The yeah. Guardian, economic policy, the competition between the two major parties, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I feel like the space you inhabit is slightly different to that right mm -hmm. um and i wanted to know from your perspective how do you see the british left the organized left do you sort of like look at it from afar and think you know they really need to understand a bit more philosophy <laughs> or, <laughs> i don't know comment on comment on 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 the part of the left that yeah is, is further removed from sort of like your world which which is very much based sort of like in philosophy and ideas mm -hmm. in conversation and argument yeah uh, so capital p politics um i mean i was saying before we started I've, I've gotten to where i am on youtube by being very careful of capital p politics uh if you've seen my video on uh brexit you'll know that i i talk about which way i voted but i'm still 
try and in fact the, so for every video I try and set myself a challenge uh, like a personal goal and my challenge for the Brexit one was be even handed uh, and I failed but I think I failed in interesting ways and that made the video overall a success and that kind of my failure and that sort of informed the video overall um, I I bet that if I mean like like wine I suppose or like Marvel movies or anything like craft brewing if you get really get into capital p politics it could suck up your whole life and i'm conscious of that yeah it does yeah yeah i, I know i'm conscious <laughs> and i have exactly the right kind of brain for that i could i would just like live it at twitter all day just like and i still do sometimes i log in and i'm like god i can't believe somebody said that um this is ridiculous uh and it could it could just suck up my whole life so i try and stay in a creative place and in a curious place um i obviously have like my own political views and i do vote uh, I I keep them <laughs> relatively close to my yeah. chest, um, and part of the way in which I do that is is by being a little more soft on the capital B politics than certainly Navarra does. Um, various people can read between the lines. I actually really like it when I get emails from people being like, "I think you're this," and I'm not. I really like that when people are like, mm. "I think you're like X, Y, and Z," or you you vote this way, and I'm like, "Ah, ah I fooled you." <laughs> um, I also really, really like it when people say, um, "I get this a lot, like almost once every day." Uh, how do like, how do you identify? What political label do you use? And I say, "I'm a leftist," and I, I leave it at that because I've I have found through experience in my own life. If I were to say, for instance, I'm an anarchist, I'm a communist, mm. or like I'm a Tory, or whatever it is, um, then people say, "Oh, so that means you must agree with this," and I, and I would have to immediately go, "No, that's not what that means," or "No, I like the idea of that, but not the specific policy," or "I like that, but not the person," and I'm immediately on the back foot. Whereas if I say I'm a leftist, people go, "Ooh, tell me more," and then I get to say, "Okay, what I want is this." Like that, I think this is a good idea. Um, it reminds me of a joke that um, my friend, uh, comedian Phil Wang. Uh, said, he used to say, uh, he said, if you smoke cigarettes out of a carton, people go, that's disgusting, it's a filthy habit, that's awful. But if you smoke roll-ups, people go, oh, so what are you working on at the moment? <laughs> you got a script I can read? Like, <laughs> So if I have a little bit more of an artisan approach to it, I find that that helps in terms of going around knocking on doors because people are on the lookout for people who are like wearing a rosette if they don't open the door, right? Mm, exactly. To extend the doors metaphor torturously. Uh, I mean, a lot of these questions are on capital P politics, so I'm going to kind of go for the ones that are a bit less capital P politics. Um, or if, unless you want to see me do acrobatics around them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Shoada Patrick, best and worst philosophers. <sighs> this should be right up your street. Tough one. Um, that's kind of hard. I mean, I, with philosophers, I'm kind of like I am with music. I don't have one fave. I just kind of pick and choose from lots of different areas. Um Again, like best philosophers, when people say like best YouTubers, I'm just going to say people that I know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Ephraim Glick taught me logic. He's a legend. Simon Prosser wrote a really cool book on time. Uh, he tried to prove that time didn't exist and was late to his own lecture, which was hilarious. Like, um, so I would say like just people I know um, and that I like. Uh, and sometimes there are some philosophers who I'm like, oh, you're interesting, or who write well. Um, but I'm like not entirely on board with what they say. So uh, Jonathan Glover, I give people uh, if you sign up to my Patreon to a certain level, I give you like a copy of Jonathan Glover's book that I've signed, "Causing Death and Saving Lives," because I think Jonathan Glover writes very clearly. I don't agree with everything he says, but I think he's like good at it. Um, Christine Overall, another one, wrote a really cool book about reproductive rights. Don't agree with anything in it, but but kind of like it. Um, so yeah, so best ones I would sort of pick and choose from a lot of different places, as with bands. Worst. Once you get down to the worst philosopher's end, it's like, is this person really a philosopher? Like, is Ayn Rand really a philosopher? Is John Jordan Peterson really a philosopher? I don't know. I don't feel like I should have the right to say who is and who isn't because people call me one and I don't think I am. Um, so I don't know. Uh, you could probably guess who I think is is the worst. You didn't seem to like Jordan Peterson very much, I suppose. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a huge but, fan. But maybe it gets maybe it gets. Although, as I it. explain in my video, I'm the only true Jordan Peterson fan in the entire world. What's your take on? I did some philosophy at undergrad, and it seemed like the big schism uh, was between analytic and continental philosophy. Do you have a position? Oh yeah, I get that all the time. I'm not sure it's like a very useful distinction, really. Um, I think it's a distinction that some uh, bro undergrads are fond of, but um, I'm not. I'm not like a. You know, Are you I, calling my my undergrad contemporary bros? Not at all. I mean, I, I was a philosophy bro for like <laughs> two years. You know, I mean, were it not for reading Sam Harris's The End of Faith 
and realizing, oh God, I'm being sold on something that maybe I didn't realize. There are doors opening that I didn't realize were being opened. Um, then I would have gone down that way as well. Like mm. I, I was like watching anti-feminist content and like your Thunderfoots and your Sargons in my first two years of YouTube and there, but for the grace of God, would have gone I And people would have been making reply videos to me and Natalie would have been making incredibly all night 30 minutes videos mm. explaining why I'm a shithead and we'd never have met. <laughs> what do you think about that sort of route from new atheism to, to the right? Because I mean, a lot of that is based on the idea that of, I suppose, a, well, I mean, they like to claim that it's all about reason and rationality and what they can offer, which mm. the left can't, yeah. is that they're willing to have an open, clear argument that conforms to the laws of logic. Yeah. So, like, how, how do you see that whole uh, I kind of did a video about this. I did, um, I, did a vid- I did a series called Are You Rational, which is quite good. And part three was called Are You Rational, Are You Emotional? And it was, um, and it's very easy to insist on a, on a civil debate when you yourself define the parameters of civility. I think I, I, Ben Shapiro does this a lot in that infamous interview with Andrew Neil. Uh, he's just like, you know, I'm happy to have a civil conversation. It's like, yeah, but you're you're the one setting the you're the one setting the boundaries of what is civil. You keep that door closed. Whereas actually, you know, people might want to open up other ideas of what that meant. Um, so I mean, yeah, people like rationality, logic, and power. They're, they're kind of power words. They're almost like magic words, um, and anyone can claim them. What I like doing is uh, is kind of turning them on its head and like using those to describe people that the right would traditionally have used them against um i like i like playing with words in that way um can you expand I, on that a bit because that's kind of difficult to understand so what, what do you mean by that sort of turning the concepts of logic rationality on their head well um i i, I don't want to spoil too much where my next video is going. okay sorry um but uh so um there are some people who, who will say like uh you know you've got to have a civil conversation or like i'm not afraid of new ideas and then you can actually turn that on his head and be like, well, then if you're really not, then what about this? You know, why, why are you kind of not, you're not being entirely consistent here? Um, and I don't expect I'll ever convince them, but you can sometimes get their audience to go, ooh, yeah, I guess if we're being fair, if we're playing fair here, then we should like kind of be consistent about it. So again, I don't think I've explained that very well, but I don't want to spoil too much where I'm thinking of going. Watch the next video. Yeah. And my series, Are You Rational? Which, um, oh, yeah. which is Philosophy Tube season one, but I'm still kind of proud of it. This is from Mercati. It's quite specific, but I like it. And it's uh, keeping away from capital P politics in, in a perfect way. So this is from Mer- Mercati. In the Jordan Peterson video, hedonism came up. Mm. Can Ollie expand on it? Most people I talk to about it have this idea that you can't make long-term decisions whilst living he- hedonistically. Oh, why not? I mean, I also suppose as an introduction, you, were you telling people to live their lives hedonistically? I wasn't the end of- telling people, I was raising it as an alternative that Peterson doesn't quite fully consider. And that a lot of people, I think, not just Peterson and people sort of in his political sphere, but I, I for research for that video, um, I read a lot of, like, Petersons from elsewhere, a lot of discount Petersons, of which there are many. Mm. Um, uh, I, I won't name anyone, I don't want to slag anyone off, but there are quite a few books like 12 Rules for Life, kind of philosophy self-help. There's a lot There's a lot of, like, Petersons of various flavours, you know, you can you can customise your Peterson. Um you can sometimes go for, you know, Tesco and brand Jordan Peterson. And a lot of people dismiss hedonism quite quickly. And I was like, okay, how can I... This is an interesting, like a very rich philosophical idea that people have talked about a lot. How can I just open that door a little bit? Um, so uh, preference hedonism, to give it the technical name, is the idea uh, that a good life is one that is characterized by pleasure, where pleasure is any mental state that is desired. Um which uh, is, it's about BDSM, basically. Um, it's like an actual argument in, in philosophy people have actually raised. You know, if hedonism is about pleasure, what about sometimes pain that's kind of pleasure? So that's why you define pleasure as any mental state that is desired. So mm-hmm. if you desire in the moment to be in pain and have a willing partner willing to inflict that pain, then that counts as pleasure. Um, so that's why we have that technical bit. Um, and people say, oh, like hedonism is all about short-term decisions, it's about being a, like a slave to your whim. And Peterson has all this stuff about you need to think about what you want and how you get it and like your whole life and sacrifice pleasure now for gain later. But I see that as all being consistent with hedonism. If you take hedonism as an attempt to maximize pleasure over your lifetime, to live the life that has the most pleasure in, that's actually surprisingly consistent with a lot of what Peterson says and consistent with a lot of the 12 rules for life um, in a way that he kind of writes off and dismisses. And I see a lot of people doing that. So I was like, "Mm, okay, what if it's less about like capital M meaning mm. that that like capital M meaning that has a bunch of like religious and politics stuff that Peterson smuggled in underneath it and more about hedonism and pleasure because I find that interesting because uh, any mental state that is desired 
uh, means that it's kind of individual and you have to let people say well actually this is what's going to bring me pleasure um, and it's consistent with his views of like knowing yourself and thinking about what you want you can keep all of that um, and sacrificing pleasure now for greater pleasure later or greater pleasure overall absolutely that's all consistent um, so that's why I kind of like hedonism I wrote one of my um, one of my undergrad papers defending preference hedonism and I, st- mm. I think it's got a little more gas in it than people uh, than people think sometimes I suppose two connected questions which is one sort of from that description I mean I'm not I don't have a particularly sort of like overarching moral philosophy I think probably somewhat utilitarian but I'm not particularly strict well, about it. Are, yeah. uh, but you're saying preference, well, is preference hedonism yours? It sounds like that's potentially a little bit ego-y. You know, does it, does, where do other people come in on that? Uh, yeah. and, and if that's not it, do you have a sort of overarching moral philosophy that you live by and think people should live by? I don't think I do. I think I'm way too human to have a consistent overarching moral philosophy um, and would probably fail uh, if I did. Um, but uh, I guess, yeah, one of the objections to preference hedonism uh, or hedonism generally is that uh, you could, what if you live a very pleasurable life but it's very immoral? Um, yeah, I think that's like a very serious objection. Um, it's It's... One answer to that, which I think is a fairly weak answer, is to say, well, actually, most people's idea of pleasure wouldn't contravene, uh, like, other people's, and actually it's possible to get all of them. Um, I will see. I don't know. Um, For me, a more... That objection gets made a lot in the philosophical literature. For me, the objection that I raised to hedonism in the Jordan Peterson video that I find more compelling is that sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes, like, you don't want pleasure. Sometimes Mm. life is just so, like, oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, that's what the bit in the bathtub was about. We've come full circle. The joke about me being in the bathtub was uh, I took a lot of MDMA one night, had a great time, loads of pleasure. And then the next day, uh, if you've done MDMA or you know about it, you'll know that it uh, builds up serotonin in your brain, uh, stops it from dissipating. Uh, and then the next day, my brain was like, well, like you've had your serotonin for the week. I'm not making any more. So all day I was just like, oh, God. And I just looked at the ceiling for hours and I was just like, bring me fancy paintings and I'll set fire to them I just um, so for me that's a more object, uh, a more interesting objection to hedonism is that sometimes it doesn't work and it's like well is that okay because that also means that you need to include within if you want to be a preference hedonist you need to include the possibility of forgiving yourself and like a failure which is something that, that Peterson stresses the importance of that his system I think is a little bit inflexible it's just like sometimes people fall short of what What if you fail the 12 rules for life what if you fall short of it um, so yeah you need that, to buy the sequel maybe yeah the 13th rule for life is he writing another one well, presumably he's got a book deal for another book I'm not sure what he's oh, writing yeah, next that's a fair point yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a very public sociologist asked uh, what is fully automated luxury communism if it is not hedonism for all ooh I don't know, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's one for Aaron. I haven't, uh, I haven't read Aaron's book. This is, it's not out yet, so you've got a good excuse. Oh, okay. Uh, Samra, this is a big question. Is the canon of philosophy inherently racist? <sighs> Depends what you include in the canon. I know that's a terrible philosopher's answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's a terrible, terrible answer. But yeah, again, it depends what you include in the canon. Um, and what you mean by inherently, I'm sorry to give all these shit answers. I did do a video on um, how we confront the fact that sometimes philosophers were really bloody racist like I did a mm. video um, uh, on Kant it was called uh, is philosophy just white guys jerking off where I talk about like how do we confront the fact that Kant was really racist um, and there are a few approaches one is to go it doesn't matter one is to go well it matters but it's not relevant to his work and one is to go it matters that it is relevant to his work mm. and this is a challenge um, and I think that actually opens up more doors and more interesting conversations um, so I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's a very good question to keep asking because it opens a lot of doors. This is a good one. Garrax, thoughts on milkshaking? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I presume most of our audience are aware of what this refers to, but it is uh, the idea of throwing a milkshake on a right-wing or far-right politician. So in the m- very recent European elections, milkshakes were uh, launched and landed upon Tommy Robinson. Gloriously. Uh, Carl Benjamin. Carl, multiple, multiple Carl. Carl was made sticky, stickier four times potentially. I think. Four was it? Oh. And Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage as well. Oh yeah, Newcastle. That was it. Was, I was, it was so Nigel Farage proud when it of Newcastle. Became a national story. Yeah, yeah, I was so proud of Newcastle for that. Well, I've kind of shown my hand a little bit there. Um. <laughs> okay, you, well, you've shown your hand, so justify it. Now, last week we had John Curtis on, and he was very against the milkshaking. Really? Why? Uh, he said that if you've got a registered political party as is the brexit party then they have a right to go out and make their argument and campaign mm-hmm. without uh, fear of being milkshaked and an argument we've seen uh, often 
uh, in the mainstream media over the last week is the idea that milkshakes can lead to greater acts of, of violence because politics in general becomes more coarse and it's seen as acceptable to move beyond the realm of discourse and argument to uh, physical confrontation, even if that is only in the form of a, of a dairy drink. Okay, so I think you made two points there. Um, I'd say the second one first about things moving beyond and becoming coarser. I think what interests me about that is the presumption that it isn't already. I think there are lots of people who could quite justifiably say that politics is already quite coarse and that already involves a lot of violence. Uh, I think there are people in this country who've had a lot worse done to them and by this country who've had a lot worse done to them by milkshakes. So the idea that politics is becoming coarse or coarser uh, relies on a particular understanding of where we currently are that I it might be interesting to get curious about and that a lot of people who are critical of the status quo would want us to get curious about. Um, and what was the... So that's kind of where I am with that. What was the first one? Uh, the other one was well, the idea that... a political it's, party and yeah. they... Yeah. It's, it's somewhat a threat to democracy. Well, not necessarily a mortal threat to democracy, but the idea that it's not quite right that if someone has registered as a political party and they mm-hmm. are taking part in a campaign, then you should treat that with the respect it deserves mm-hmm. and offer argument, not try to uh, scare them off the streets, even if that is only mm-hmm. through dairy drinks. What interests me about that is uh, it presumes that the standards of registering for a political party are all A-OK, whereas, you know, maybe there's some doors to open. Do you think they should be higher? I don't know what they are currently. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just saying, like that, that it is a, like a, a structural feature of that argument that it presumes that that is all okay, and it's like, well, somebody could get curious about that. That's how I could see someone approaching countering that particular response. Um, I've tipped my hand, I think, by uh, by revealing that I think milkshaking is. You're kind of fine with it, right? Yeah, it's pretty funny. Like, um, and again, I'm sure they would say, "Well, you won't like it if it's done to you." And fair enough, I wouldn't. Um, but if I didn't think that I could prove that my ideas were better than theirs, then I then I wouldn't have them. Well, also, I mean, you kind of when they said that you wouldn't mind if it was done to you, you wouldn't like it if it was done to you. I mean, I wouldn't no. like it, but I also no, no, wouldn't no. call it the end of democracy or say that it was a form of violence. I'd say it was bloody annoying, but you know. Well, I t- well maybe I would. Maybe I would. You know, um, if I was that upset. Someone, Pat H, has said we used to we used to use fascists to decorate lamp posts. Uh, not quite a question, a comment. Uh, Tamer than milkshaking. Oh, this is a very good question uh, from Sipeta. What view do you hold that you think is most out of step with current left discourse? Out of step with yeah. current left discourse. Okay. Hmm. That's a tough one. It's the kind of question you should ask when you're drunk and sort of like in quick fire mode. So you have yeah, to just blurt it out. Yeah, Not yeah. potentially like on live on YouTube. But anyway, go on. There are definitely some views that I think I could improve on. But as a mainstream leftist discourse, I d- again, like real philosopher's answer, what is that? <laughs> who, who gets to decide what that is? Um, I don't know. I'm having trouble coming up with anything like definitive off the top of my head. Like, I mean, I suppose another way, another way of framing that is yeah. your videos that do... Uh, verge into politics basically are all critiquing uh, the alt-right or people who it's popularly acknowledged are right-wing politicians and right-wing thinkers no, i don't I know you're maybe going to correct me i did a whole series called what was liberalism and in fact i got a i got a message from a, an office in north london who said we watch youtube videos for our lunch breaks every friday we just watched your series what was liberalism and now we've all been radicalized <laughs> what's your critique of liberalism um it was kind of multiple i did like a four part series on it um like where it came from and how it's sort of tied in with capitalism and how it has a tendency to slide to the right under certain circumstances so it was kind of yeah i don't want to butcher it by summarizing it overly here but, but what about critiques of leftism so you are a leftist have you got any sort of like um critiques of your own side yeah, I've got a, I've got a few. Um, I, I I again keep them close to my chest because it's like about like specificity, and you could sort of find out where I am um, by what critiques I have. But um, yeah, what views do I have that are like out of step with current leftist discourse? That's a hard one. I mean, Sipeta's come back with a sort of galaxy brain follow up question, yeah. which is perhaps it's because Ollie is the current left discourse himself. Yikes! That's a worrying possibility. <laughs> 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 Is anarchism part of the general left-wing consensus? I mean, which consensus in which country? You can't ask two questions, the snarky lesbian, uh, because the, the second one made the first one quite confusing. Yeah, I'm not president <laughs> of the left. Like, I don't... <laughs> Is anarchism a part of the left? I, like, oh, I'd be inclined to say, yeah, that's pretty left-wing, like... Surely, <laughs> I don't think it's controversial to say that anarchism is left wing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that's that's all right. That one. But I'm not, I'm not like the left president. 
<laughs> I'm not Mr. Left. Um, is he, You're not going to answer that one. Is he a lab member? Is he a Labour member? No comment. No comment. I thought so. Um, all right. Who is Mr. Left? <laughs> this is a lot of fun. Yeah, they, these <laughs> questions have gotten a little bit weird, to be honest. Really? My favourite. Yeah. Oh, do you think leftists need to read more Hegel or less from ASMR theory? Ooh. I mean, I, I, I would cop to saying that I've read like very little Hegel. Um, you know, I read enough to do a video on the master and slave dialectic. Some of the responses, I think, to Hegel and the interpretations of Hegel are really good. Like Franz Fanon on Hegel is like, like real good. Really enjoy his work. Um, so sometimes having a little, a little bit of Hegel under your belt can be like a useful, useful thing. But I, I wouldn't say don't don't stress about it. You know? Is there not a moral philosophy which says you shouldn't tell anyone to do something you wouldn't do yourself? Uh, I mean, I probably most I've of them read that in like Christmas crackers and stuff. I mean, because yeah. that would be my take on Hegel, which is that I'm not going to read it, so I'm not going to tell anyone on the left to read it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that would break one of my twelve rules for life. <laughs> so there's no pressure to read Hegel, guys. There's no shame in never having read even one paragraph. I don't even know his first name. I was going to call him Antonio Hegel. Was Antonio, he- <laughs> Antonio Hegel. What is his first name? George, right? George, George Hegel. Yeah. No idea. No. Uh, I'm going to get owned online now. <laughs> it's not George. <laughs> it's George. It's canon. It's George. I'm president of the left. It's George. Joshua Boyd. What is Ollie's view of Zizek? <laughs> um, I've actually read. Uh, I've read on violence, which I did a video on, which I thought was fine, uh, was decent book i thought much of the good things about it had been said elsewhere and had some drawbacks um i did not watch the jack peterson debate uh i went on holiday and that was the first night of my holiday uh so uh i was among other things very drunk when that happened and uh have not not caught up with it i was too busy having a lot of fun um so i I didn't watch the Zizek Peterson debate. I don't watch all that much Zizek. I find some of his concepts to be quite useful. In my Elon Musk video, I talk about um, disavowal and uh, and liberal communism. I think those are like interesting, cool concepts. Um, but uh, yeah, as I say, the only the only time I've really sat down and like really engaged with Zizek like in detail is on violence, and I found that to be fine. All right, we're coming up to. Uh, the end of the show it's almost Aww. been an hour so I'm going to ask you just one last question Aww, was uh, which is from Sam Gittins uh, does he think one of Left Tube's limitations is its aversion to a positive vision which is interesting is all you do critique aversion to a positive vision this is interesting this is a great question to end on because no matter how much positive vision I offer people always ask this it's there it's it's in my videos like my most recent one like who asked it who is this uh, Sam Gittins. Sam, go and watch my most recent video, man. It's it's in there. Go and watch my one on the housing crisis. It's there. What is the positive vision? Can you kind of sum it up? You'll have to go and watch the video. <laughs> Come on, give us a clue. Give us a clue. <laughs> well, I think I have a pretty positive vision of decriminalising sex work in that video. The housing crisis one, I think that... This is the thing. It's like when I... People are always people sometimes critique me for like not being radical enough or all you do is critique. You don't offer any positive vision. I'm like, that's not true. Like go and go and watch H Bomber guys videos. Go and watch Nats. Go and watch mine and like really, really watch them. It's there. It's definitely there. Um, you just maybe just missing it a little bit because it's not because it's not the video you expect. Mm. And do you think that's potentially because it's not like capital P politics, right? So I suppose when people say a positive vision, they kind of mean spell out what so- what yeah. your society would Who look clap, like. Who clap? Do clap? You clap? Vote for? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean the kind of thing I like, you know. Exactly. What we're going to give you is a mixed market economy, and the working class is going to be very powerful. And it's going to be called class, wealth, social democracy. Or you have Aaron telling us about fully automated luxury communism. Mm-hmm. Whereas I'm more of just like, hello, like who's there? <laughs> Someone's saying H bomber guy, get him on, please. H bomber guy has been on. Uh, there's an interview with him oh, yeah, and an Ash Sarkar, yeah. just after uh, which the, was excellent. So you can check stream. that out oh, that afterwards. Um, but yeah, no. Let's wrap this up. Thank you so much oh, for coming I was on. Enjoying talking to the channel. And uh, do check out all the rest of Philosophy Tube's videos because they are excellent. And I apologise for the fact that I think when we started to show the Jordan Peterson one, we only saw a clip of you in the bath and then and then a blank screen because much of the video <laughs> is excellent and well worth watching. That bit's excellent too in context. Um, <laughs> oh, no. I'm, I was just getting distracted by other questions we're not going to do any more questions it's over uh thank you so much for watching tisky sour we will be back the same time next week uh as ever you know this is only possible because of your kind support if you are already uh subscriber to navarro media thank you very much if not 
please uh, go to support.navarromedia.com and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month so we can continue working around the clock. We want to do more of these shows more often, more emergency shows, and I think in the near future there are probably going to be a few more political emergencies. Uh, Ollie Fawn, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us My this pleasure. evening. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Uh, good night, see you next week.